A big thank you to our faculty for today for taking the time not only to prepare the materials, but also, of course, to come here. So let me introduce our first faculty member, Gus Bauman, who is of counsel at Beverage and Diamond, where his practice focuses on, oddly enough, land use and environmental issues, um, and where he advises clients on matters such as comprehensive planning, project development, and natural resource regulation. His recent matters have included zoning, historic preservation, wetlands, NEPA, TMDL, and Clean Air Act transportation conformity issues. Next to him, we have Jim McElfish, who is a senior attorney here at ELI, where his research focuses on development choices and their links to water resources, biological diversity, and infrastructure policy. He's also director of ELI's Sustainable Use of Land Program, which makes connections among state laws, policies, taxes, investments, and land use outcomes. So with that, I will turn it over to both of them. Well, um, <clears throat> first off, to give some of you hope, um, I was in law school during the recession of 73-74, which I know was way before you all were born. Um, Nixon was in the White House, and it was the worst, it was the worst post World War II recession up until, you know, now. Um, <laughs> but 73-74 was bad, and I was in law school, and so. Um, uh, I, was, I happened to be at a law school with a famous land use and environmental law professor, and I fell into his program. There was no planning involved in this. I came from a city that was the minor league city for uh, AAA for the St. Louis Cardinals, and our major league team was the Cardinals, and I always wanted to see Cardinals play. So I went to St. Louis to go to law school um, at Washington University, and then I could see the Cardinals play at Bush Stadium. Um, and, uh, but it turned out that they had a famous professor who's still there, and he was very well known in land use and environmental law, and he still is. And so I fell into the program. There was no plan here at all. Um, and then um, I got recruited by this agency in Maryland called the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, created by state law, and it is the land use and parks agency from Montgomery County and Prince George's County, which are the two counties in Maryland that adjoin and abut the District of Columbia. Um, so I went there in the legal department, you know, and the general counsel never told me, by the way, you know, um, you know, I said, oh, Maryland's a little state, you know, what's the big deal, you know, take the bar exam. He never told me until I got here that the pass-fail rate of the Maryland bar in the 1970s was 50-50, <laughs> literally 50-50 pass-fail rate. We, uh, we arrived here at, with our two-door Dotson, my girlfriend, now wife, back in uh, 74, um, Nixon is hanging on by his fingernails and is going <laughs> to resign the next month when Barry Goldwater walked up to the White House and said, you know, when they impeach you, we're going to convict you. And Goldwater gave the coup de grace to Nixon, little known fact, but I can't help myself. And that's when he <laughs> told Nixon, and I will vote for conviction. When Nixon heard Goldwater say that, he knew he was cooked, and so he resigned the next month. So I ended up at this agency in the legal department, and I did that in the 70s. And I can say working at a government agency like that, it's always fun because you, they throw you into everything. So for those of you who end up going into a government agency when the summer is over, they throw you into everything, you know, because they're desperate, usually. And, and you know, they need bodies and they need young, bright lawyers. And so that's what I did. And they threw me into everything. Administrative law, regulatory law, litigation law, legislative. I got to go to Annapolis all the time and watch legislation get made. Oh, my God. Um, this is why when we talk about the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act and you think a bunch of Solons on the Hill are writing this stuff and in that, no way. I mean, anyway. Um, so I did that for a bunch of years. Then um, I got recruited to go work at a big trade association. So I go from a government agency to a trade association. This one was called the National Association of Home Builders. And I ended up running the legal um, department, which really meant land use and environmental law. That's what it meant. And I worked on a lot of Supreme Court cases in those days throughout the 1980s, which is where I met Jim um, in the 1980s um, with all these Supreme Court cases that were going on. And I was involved in those. And, and um, anyway, so I did that for a bunch of years. And then I got recruited into this law firm called Beverage and Diamond, which is an environmental and land use law firm in the D.C. office. Um, so I said, okay, well, you know, I don't know anything about law firms. I've never been to a law firm, never stepped foot in a law firm, um, and they, I just lateraled in. So it's possible. So I went from government agency to a trade group, you know, into a law firm. And then the next thing I know, the political people in Maryland made me chairman of, the, of this agency, uh, which was a full-time job. So I had to resign my partnership at the law firm. Um, I had to go in and tell the managing partner who had recruited me, um, you know, I'm leaving. And, um, and uh, anyway, 
so I left. Um, and I went and chaired this agency for a bunch of years, and it, it was, um, it's full time, and it was a big agency. So we did downtown Silver Spring, downtown Bethesda. The thing that you will maybe read about called the Purple Line. I was there at the inception. I chaired all those hearings. I was involved in writing all those plans, and we've been implementing those plans ever since. So I did all that stuff for a long time, and then, um, then. You know, a bunch of people say, oh, you know, you all run for office. This is what Jim remembers. Um, I don't think, no, you're Virginia. He couldn't vote for me. Um, he would have if he lived in Maryland. Um, but he couldn't vote for me. Um, but, so I ran for county executive um, because this group of women sat me down and said, look, the two alternatives, oh my God, so you should run and be the third alternative. Well, that didn't work out. So, <laughs> so I didn't get elected. I ended up, though, advising the guy who did get elected and, and um, spent 12 years helping him behind the scenes. But the point is I went back to my law firm in an of counsel position, which is where I've been for the last 20 years. And I do land use and environmental law, all kinds of stuff. Um, projects, public projects, private projects, um, litigation, regulatory, administrative. That, so the, the point of my story is you never know what's going to happen with your career path. Trust me. You never know how <laughs> something serendipity just comes up when a bunch of people say, hey, you know, this would be a good idea. And the best laid plans. And so I always tell people who call me and I meet with them all the time, people who look like you, who are young, I say, look, don't get discouraged in this economy. Um, because you never know what pops up. Just keep throwing the pebbles in the pond. The ripples go out. Something will come back. What a tale, Gus. Uh, <laughs> Told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, <laughs> signifying nothing. So, so, so Gus is my guru of land use law. So when I don't know anything, I, I know that Gus will know the answer or, or at least know the person who does know the answer. It, uh, I, he, he is too humble, trust me. <laughs> Um, I'm much younger than Gus. Um, I, I finished law school in 1979 at, at Yale and came down to work for the Interior Department in the solicitor's office. So I was a natural resources lawyer having the qualifications of taking all two of the environment and natural resources courses that were offered at the time at my law school, environmental law and natural resources law. I don't know if they're doing much better than that right now at, at Yale or not. but. Hmm? Yeah, climate, change law. climate change law now. Okay. Well, I'd have taken that if I had known about it. <laughs> that's that's really excellent to to know. So I was at Interior for a, a few years, um, doing work with the National Park Service and uh, being exposed to areas of Indian law and water resources and grazing and all kinds of of um, issues that continue to to persist. Um, I'm amazed at how many legal problems are the same as they were 34, 35 years ago when I, I got started. And I also had the privilege of being um, one of the enforcement attorneys for uh, a new program at the time, uh, the federal program to regulate the environmental effects of coal mining, which is one of the few federal um, inroads into a land use related activity. Uh, the Coal miners didn't care for that very much. They actually brought a, a case that made its way to the Supreme Court, which said, you're regulating land use. That's a state function. It's not a federal function, to which the federal government said, we're protecting interstate commerce in coal, in clean water, uh, in, um, in a, a safe environment. Uh, and the Supreme Court unanimously held that the federal government had not exceeded its powers uh, uh, in, uh, in regulating coal mines. Interestingly, one of the people who had brought the case challenging that, uh, that uh, coal mine legislation was a fellow uh, with a conservative legal organization uh, by the name of James Watt. Um, James Watt, um, during the period of time when the case was working its way through the federal courts, um, was appointed uh, by President Reagan to run the Secretary of Interior, the agency responsible for carrying out the law that he had challenged as unconstitutional. And, um, and so things changed quite a bit, although the Supreme Court up, upheld the law and so the Interior Department is free to go forward and regulate coal mines in cooperation with the states. It was not exactly the, the way that Secretary Watt had hoped it would have, would have come out. Um, 
Watt, what, by the way, Jim is so polite and diplomatic. Watt resigned in disgrace. He was, his view of running the Interior Department was basically to sell the natural resources of the United States. So he was not a close personal friend of any of us on this panel. I'm going to remain diplomatic um, and, um, <laughs> and, um, and just suffice it to say that uh, along about 1981, I found myself looking for uh, other <laughs> legal employment, <laughs> which I was pleased to find at the firm of Dow Onis and Albertson here in, in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I was with that firm for about uh, five and a half or six years. Um, interestingly, that was the heart of that next major recession, the recession of 81, 82, right. when all the environmental practices in this city went down the tubes. And, Except including, for Beverage and Diamond. Right. Uh, but some. We're slow but steady. And, uh, and I admire you for that. Um, we once did a panel, and um, this is God on his true story. And at the time, our law firm, which is a national law firm, so it's a national law firm. But so, and back then, it had 75 lawyers. Today, we have about 100 lawyers. So, but we're everywhere, and we do have the best. I, I, I can humbly say that. Um, we were founded by the first head of EPA and a bunch of environmental lawyers uh, right, at the, in the, right after the, um, in the early 70s when all the laws were being enacted. But this is truth. We're on a pan uh, I wasn't there, Jim. There was a panel of all these people at a national conference. It was the EPA person, blah, 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 blah. And they had a person from Beverage and Diamond. They're going down the panel saying who they are and what they do, blah, blah, just like what Jim's doing and what I did. And they got to the Beverage and Diamond lawyer. He says, I'm Beverage and Diamond. I'm an attorney at Beverage and Diamond. I'm in the Washington, D.C. office. We're a national environmental law firm. And we do international, by the way. We do international. We help countries, blah, blah, blah. And he said, and there are 75 uh, lawyers in our firm. And the guy leans over, swear to God, from EPA. And he says, there's only 75 of you? <laughs> OK, didn't, didn't kill over well. <laughs> Yeah, should there have been more, or you're having an outsized they, footprint? They were, uh, they were implying that there were hundreds of us. Yeah. That's what he thought. But there were only 75 then. Every one of them a powerhouse of legal uh, acumen, as far as I can tell. I don't know, Jim. We haven't hired you yet. <laughs> I hope I'm not looking for a job anytime soon, Gus. Um, I was at uh, Dal Onis as a litigator for most of that period of time. Some was environmental uh, permitting and other kinds of work, but given the recession, there was not a lot of environmental work, so I represented a number of uh, aviation companies, uh, commercial litigation and the like, and in 1986, I had the good fortune to answer an ad and come to the Environmental Law Institute, um, where I've been ever since, working initially on mining and resource kinds of issues, uh, RICRA and hazardous waste, and many of the other topics that this summer school series has addressed. Um, but somehow, uh, along the course of those activities, it became apparent to me that uh, land use um, was one of those factors that combined a lot of my interests in environment. So a lot of your water-related impacts are not Clean Water Act sort sorts of uh, concerns or activities. They have more to do with how is land developed and what rules apply with land development. Um, and so I found myself getting more and more into land use uh, and at one point um, was uh, recruited to serve on a panel that the American Planning Association had put together to rewrite uh, model laws for the states on how they would write their state land use uh, planning and enabling laws, an enterprise which had last been done in a serious way in the 1920s, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit. Um, and at that time, I had the good fortune to work with Gus uh, again, who was advising um, uh, the, the, home, the home builders, right. and we were representing, in effect, the natural environment right. in, in a collaborative effort uh, to, to come up with some model legislation. Right. So that's more than enough history uh, of background, but you, you could move from, from uh, doing natural resources and mining regulation through a number of activities. And the, the common thread seems to be, one, political change, and two, recessions happen a lot. And, um, and uh, one of the great things about law is you can often be nimble enough to learn and work in new areas. And it's one of the things that keeps it, keeps it fresh, uh, keeps it interesting. 
Um, I'm going to jump into uh, some of the background of, of um, land use uh, law. One of the important things to be clear is what we're talking about. So we're talking about land to begin with, and when we think about land as lawyers, we think about land as property. So how do you know you have a piece of property? Well, you have a deed. Where did you get the deed? You got the deed from the prior owner of the property. Where did they get the deed? From the prior owner going back to, uh, in effect, uh, in, in the United States, mostly grants from the, from the Crown, which is when they sort of start legal history. So you have a piece of property. What does that give you? Well, it gives you the power to exclude others. This is my property, keep out, power to exclude. You get the power to convey the property. I'm going to sell it to you. I'm going to lease it to you for a year. I'm going to will it uh, to you. Um, you have the power to convey or, or devise. You have the power to use property. The default has been, I'm going to live on it. And some of the other defaults is I'm going to use it for economic activity. I'll put up my lemonade stand, or I'll build my business, or I'll put up my giant slaughterhouse right across the street from your residential subdivision. Um, you can do that in Houston. <laughs> some, some parts of Houston, this is true. That's true. So you have the, the power to use for activity, and you have something that the English common law refers to as the power of quiet enjoyment to be unmolested in your enjoyment and, and uh, mere possession of property and to be master of, of all you survey with, without fear of inroads from your neighbors. And the common law over the centuries, which we've largely inherited from the English common law, was intended to protect those bundle of rights that you have in property the power to exclude and to convey and to, to be unmolested and use the property. Um, and what the law dealt with mostly was conflicts between adjacent neighbors. So I want to put up my slaughterhouse, but it makes it unlivable. So what do we do? We, we go to, to a suit at law to enjoin one of those uses or collect money damages. And that was the law of nuisance. And so through the first part of American history, land use regulation was neighbors suing one another for uh, either an injunction or for money damages. But as cities became larger and larger and as industrial development uh, increased and the conflicts became greater and greater, it became important uh, for the government to establish sets of rules and expectations. So we don't want to resolve each one of these by neighbors suing neighbors and all these one-off suits. We can establish rules, rules about uh, what is an appropriate use for this neighborhood. How high can a building be if it's made entirely out of wood? Does it need fire escapes? Um, and, and those sorts of, of things. Now, some historians of land use law will, will look to the regulations after the Great Fire of London as setting the the street dimensions and whether you could build with wood and whether you could heat with coal. That was in 1666. It was, an important year. Um, and in the, in the uh, American colonies, there were also rules, particularly in the mid-Atlantic and northern colonies. So William Penn had this rule in Philadelphia that you had to, if you had a yard, you had to have trees. Uh, Philadelphia was the green country town. There were some rules in some of the Massachusetts uh, communities that dealt with where you could put uh, slaughterhouses because uh, they, they wanted an orderly kind of place. So people look back at some of these early types of land use, but we don't get what we think of as a regulatory land use system until the tail end of the 19th century, you know, think the tenements of, of New York, the rapid development, the rapid increase in, in population. And the early part of the 20th century, where you get the, the collision of this, this rapid industrialization, rapid development, increasing populations, prosperity of cities, together with this impulse of um, uh, the progressive tradition. Let's do this scientifically, is the, is the progressive impulse. Let's do this more efficiently. You know, cities are going to develop, and we can just let them develop willy-nilly, and we'll put the steel mill next to the lumber yard, next to the um, residential uh, hotel, next to the tenement. But 
we're modern people. This is the 19 teens and 20s for Pete's sake. Let's set up a set of rules that will orderly establish orderly rules for um, where things should go and how we go about um, doing this. Mm -hmm. So Gus, do you want to comment a little bit on that phase? Sure. Because okay. it's really important. Yeah, sure. So the idea of zoning we got from Germany. Um, in the late 19th century, Germany started zoning their cities. And as Jim is talking about, when the progressive movement hit in the early 20th century, um, they looked to this efficient system invented in Germany called zoning and thought about bringing it to American cities. The first city to enact a zoning ordinance in the United States was New York City. It was in 1916. And they did it, though, I mean, and this is what, you know, this is what land use is all about, people. Um, they didn't do it for the purest of reasons. They did it because the property owners and the big merchants and the people in the mansions on Fifth Avenue were terrified of the tenements moving from what we now call downtown New York, Manhattan, moving up the avenue into their area of the city. So they in, enacted the zoning ordinance of 1916 in New York City, first city to do it in America, um, to control uses. Now, this is a cardinal thing about zoning. Um, z and, and by the way, I should di I digress. Um, I've got an outline that you've got um, and what I did in this outline, it's only four or five pages long, is it's called the American Land Development System. Basic, what I've done in this outline, lay out for you, and every word and comma is important, but I lay out for you literally the legal system of land use in the United States, federal, state, local, how it all ties together, and it's, it's all there. And so a lot of what we're talking about, the bones of what we're talking about are on that outline. Um, and this will be on the website for those of you looking around your chair that don't have this. Oh, yeah, y'all don't have it, do you? <laughs> okay. Well, um, it's a hell of an outline. <laughs> um, no, I use it for judges at, at conferences. You know, it's a, judges don't know this stuff. They understand contract law, criminal law, tort law. They don't understand what we're talking about in this room. And so they'll sometimes use me to go to conferences and try to educate American judges on land use and environmental law. You know, because as Jim is saying, party A sues party B, they're in front of a judge. And I'm telling you right now, for any of you who end up in a courtroom dealing with land use or environmental law issues, you're probably going to be in front of a judge who has no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, and so part of your job as a lawyer is to educate the judge on what the law is, how it all fits together, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I digress. I'm sorry. But so the zoning is the thing that Jim's pointing to that came to America in 1916. And zoning is about the separation of uses. Okay? If you learn nothing else. That's what zoning's all separation of uses. These are the residential areas. These are where the apartment buildings will be. This is where the single family detached houses will be. They will be zoned R something, R for residential. These are the commercial areas. Um, and they're always on zoning maps in America. They're always painted red. So if, it's, if the map says red over here, that's commercial. And it could be for stores. It could be for all kinds of stuff, but that's commercial. And then I for industrial. And on every zoning map in this country, it's always gray for industrial. You look at a zoning map, you got the gray. And residential is always green, see? Green, residential, ah, well, you know. And it's like a pyramid where green is at the top, residential, then down to commercial, and the bottom, the base, is where these big industrial plants are, the slaughterhouses and everything like that. Those are in the industrial areas. And that is how it happened. And that's how it came to be by 1916. And then, should I, should I go to the 1920s real fast? Well, sure. Okay. And then in the 1920s, Herbert Hoover, who later became president, but before he became president, he was Commerce Secretary. And Hoover was an engineer. I mean, Hoover's genius was as an engineer. And he says, we have got to come up with a rational system for the cities of America. And this is incredible if you think about it. He was a federal official. You know, the U.S. Commerce Secretary and he's the one who said, we're going to come up with a commission to come up with a standard state enabling act for zoning. You know, so it didn't emanate from the states. It emanated from Washington, D.C., from a guy who became, you know, you know a Republican president, um, a conservative in the 20s. But 
It was that standard state zoning enabling act that they came up with. Then they came up with a parallel standard state planning act because the progressives said before you zone, you got to have a comprehensive plan for the city to figure out what's the plan going to be. So zoning, you see, and this is something, you know, it's all in my outline, but you're sitting here staring at me. Zoning implements the plan. That's the point. So you're supposed to have a plan first, then zoning. See? Um, and it's called the comprehensive plan or the general plan or the master plan. Um, however, what has transpired in the United States since the 1920s, well, since 1916, is that most communities that are kind of built up have zoning ordinances. But they don't all have comprehensive plans. They just have a zoning ordinance. Um, a lot of places do have comprehensive plans, but you don't have to unless your state law says you have to. And some states have a law that says you're going to have zoning, and before you do zoning, you're going to have a comprehensive plan. And it all comes from that idea from the 1920s, from those two commissions under Secretary Hoover before he became president, and then, of course, got crushed by Roosevelt because of the Great Depression. The Great Depression, another, another one of these themes. It's a theme. So, so you have the boom years of the 20s, and you have this progressive impulse, and you have the mining engineer, Herbert Hoover, pulling together this idea, and zoning sweeps the nation. Zoning is largely understood as a city enterprise. Where was all the growth occurring? The growth at that time is occurring in the cities. Where were the land use conflicts? It was the cities, or what we think of now as inner ring suburbs, the small cities that surrounded the mm -hmm. large city. So in writing the Standard Zoning Enabling Act, the collaborators uh, who, who came from all over the country but worked, um, worked and, and were organized uh, by Hoover's Commerce Department, um, had this mental model of the separation of uses in cities. And as we've sort of extended land use regulation out over the larger landscape, some of the implications haven't worked out as well. And much of the, the history of the last 100 years or 90 years um, have, have been trying to work out how does this model aimed at cities, aimed at a progressive vision of separating uses, which was the then modern idea, how is that working out now where we realize that by separating uses, perhaps we've got these vast residential areas with nowhere to shop? except by getting in your motor vehicle or with no jobs. And so, in a way, a, a problem that was solved very quickly and very effectively in the 20s has, in many ways, continued to define uh, the system that we've been, been living with for, for lo these many years. Can we talk about the two kinds of zoning? Is this a good time to do I want to come gonna back to that, that in just a second. Got it, got um, it. Um, one of the other things I want to say is the, this, the, these two model laws, the, the Standard Zoning Enabling Act and the uh, Standard City Planning Act, uh, were published in 1926, 1928 uh, by the Commerce Department. Um, but even while they were being drafted, this was, these were uh, plans and, and zoning ordinances were being adopted all over the country. Who were they written for? They were written for state legislatures. Why? because the control of land use is primarily in the United States a state function, not a federal government function, not even a city or local government function, but at the state. Why? Because the states, by virtue of their inherent sovereignty, or something that Gus's outline refers to as the police power, the power to protect the polis, uh, the, the, the cities, mm -hmm. the, the, the residents of the state, um, the state legislatures are the repository of, of the ability to, to regulate or determine land use. Now, they've wanted to and, and have delegated those functions to municipal governments, initially cities, you know, later counties, townships, and the like. But under the American system of law, all those local government institutions are creatures of the state. So whenever we get into constitutional issues where the 14th Amendment says no state shall, and then we're applying it to a city, why does that apply to a city? It's because a city is a creature of the state. So these zoning enabling rules and the planning um, 
Act sets up thing, guides for the legislatures. And across the country, state legislatures enact statutes in the 20s look virtually identical because they're all on the Hoover, Hoover model. And so what does is, what is land use regulation and zoning do? Well, it's there basically to uh, protect the health, safety, morals, and general welfare. So your ability to, to address land use as defined by state laws, which are almost all the same, health, safety, morals, or general welfare. Now, a lot of states drop morals out, um, but what they had in mind was sort of the, the adult, what we call adult uses or you know, red light district sorts of things. And there was some notion even that mm -hmm. certain um, forms of, of uh, you know, tenement housing that was too crowded encouraged bad morality. And so morals uh, was, was seen as, a, as an appropriate function of the police power. So zoning, almost any time you see a zoning ordinance, and the question is, is this valid or isn't it? Or is one of the uh, other ordinances that a, a town enacts valid or not? Well, can you justify it as based on health? Well, maybe. Safety? Yeah, okay. Fire escapes, uh, side yards, those kind of things. Morals? Don't know. But general welfare, that's the friend of the land use lawyer. So, Gus, you wanted to talk about the types of zoning that... Yeah, yeah. And, 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 um, and by the way, morals raises First Amendment issues, of course, you see. So you can see right there in land use regulation in America, you, if you start regulating, you know, you know, where the red light district will be or whatever, whether we're going to have it or not have it, you're raising First Amendment freedom of speech, freedom of expression issues, um, which is a big area of land use regulation, you know. Um, everything we're talking about, of course, is law. We're talking about law here. Um, and these laws are enacted by cities and counties. Um, so these zoning laws are all enacted at the local government level. Zoning, of course, is not done by the state government, and it's certainly not done by the federal government. The federal government, when you talk to, you know, they always say, the federal government people always say, we don't do local land use. That's done by the local governments and the state governments. So zoning is a legislative act. And it goes to what Jim said. Um, it's a legislative act. That means the local legislature in every jurisdiction of the United States except one. Every jurisdiction in the United States, every local, every city, county, town has the power to zone under those 50 state zoning enabling acts. And by the way, all 50 states have a zoning enabling act. They don't all have um, um, enabling acts saying that you shall write comprehensive plans. They don't all do that. A lot of them do. Um, it's up to each state, obviously, to decide if they're going to dictate comprehensive plans at the gov local government level. But they all have zoning all of them. The one exception about the local legislative body enacting the zoning ordinance is where we're sitting today, the District of Columbia. Because D.C. is not a state and is the seat of the federal government, um, I, you know, when, when, when I work with people and, and if they're familiar with zoning, they go, oh, you know, the, the city council does zoning or the board of county supervisors does zoning where I come from and everything I hear about is that then they land in Washington and then they end up doing land use and then they think they're going to do zoning and go to the D.C. Council. No. Um, D.C., because it's sui generis, it's not a state, um, just so you know, if you practice zoning, land use law in the District of Columbia, they have a thing called the Zoning Commission, an appointed body, and they do the zoning for the District of Columbia. Now, the D.C. City Council does adopt the city comprehensive plan. So. Washington, D.C. has a comprehensive plan. It is, um, you know, drafted by the Department of, you know, the Office of Planning and the Office of Zoning. They work on all of that. I won't go through all of this stuff. But they, the staff does all that, blah, 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 and they have hearings and so forth. And in the end, it's the D.C. Council that adopts the comprehensive plan after, after they hold their public hearings. But zoning is done by an appointed body, the Zoning Commission. And that is unique in the United States. Every place else, it's done by the local legislative body, which means that by definition, um, zoning and land use are inherently political because they 
you hold public hearings, and I have chaired more public hearings. I mean, I've chaired all kinds of public hearings for all kinds of things in this world and uh, what we're talking <laughs> about. And it is, you know, uh, I don't care what people say their philosophy and ideology is, when it comes to their backyard, all right? I had Edmund Muskie, who is viewed as the father of the Federal Clean Water Act and the father of the Federal Clean Air Act and, and famous liberal Democratic senator who, uh, but for the, the dirty tricks of the Nixon guys, would have been the 1972 Democratic nominee for president. And he ran for vice president in 68 with Humphrey. Um, Muskie was viewed as the father of so many federal environmental laws in this country. I will never forget a hearing I chaired for um, at the time, it was not called the Purple Line, which is a light rail um, transit line um, to being proposed in the suburbs of Maryland outside Washington, D.C. And I was involved in purchasing the property and, and coming up with a comprehensive plan to plan for this whole thing and blah, 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 um, and getting the funding, blah, 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 and chairing the hearing about the route between downtown Bethesda and downtown Silver Spring. And I kid you not, as Jack Parr used to say, um, at one of the public hearings testifying in front of me on his 80th birthday um, was the former Senator Edmund Muskie to speak against building this light rail transit line on an abandoned railway line. So we, we had purchased an abandoned rail line that coal trains used to run on and now we were going to turn it over to a uh, transit line um, for people to be on and, uh, and he came to testify against it and I wished him happy birthday told him I voted for him in 68. Um, and why was he against it? Because his home backed up to the root. Classic NIMBY testimony. Not in my backyard, that's what NIMBY means. Um, and so what Jim and I are talking about sounds scientific based on what the Germans concocted and came to New York. But if you ever go to a hearing, trust me, it's anything but scientific. So the legislation gets enacted. You should know there are two kinds of zoning. There's the zoning text and the zoning map. All of this stuff is in my outline. But it's important for you to know this as we talk about zoning because it's two things. You have the text, which is the black letter law that says these are the uses and this is what's permitted and blah, blah, blah. And then you have special uses. They're called either permitted uses or conditional uses. There's two kinds of zoning called as of right, which means if you're zoned residential single family house, you have as a matter of right, legal right to build a single family house on your property and no one can say otherwise. Then they have special um, uses that are called in the United States, either conditional uses or permitted, um, 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 uh, conditional uses and uh, special, special exceptions. exceptions. And those are uses that you can get if you meet all these criteria, criteria laid out in the zoning ordinance. And, and the classic example is someone wants to open a doctor's office in the neighborhood. Well, you know, you don't have as a matter of right that you can have a doctor's office in a residential neighborhood. But if you can show you've got off-street parking and you're not going to bother the neighbors and blah, 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 you have hours between 9 to 5, blah, blah, you meet all these criteria laid out in the zoning ordinance then the board can grant you the right to have your doctor's office. So zoning is always, everywhere in America, you have as of right uses, and then you have these special exception or conditional uses. Um, drive-ins, a drive-in anything is always going to be normally, uh, uh, you know, not as of right because people litter, they make noise, they attract the wrong element sometimes, blah, blah, blah. That's zoning. Then the map, this is big. The map is the actual map. And wherever you people live or work or play, you can go to your zoning ordinance and there's the map. And you see the red stuff, the green stuff, the yellow stuff, and the gray stuff. And the map says, oh, here's where all the, so you can look at the map and say, oh, my business or property or home or apartment is over there. So at least I know I'm in that area and that's the sort of uses I'm allowed to have. And then the final thing I'll say on this point is, because it's all law, as we all know, in America, you can change the law. All you got to do is either the government, the local government can say, we propose changing the text or we propose changing the map. Or you, as a property owner, can petition the government. You just file your application and bang, they're going to hold the public hearing. And then you say, I want to rezone my property. 
That's the magic word. Rezone my property from residential to commercial. Because instead of building a house, I want to build a store. And then a public hearing is held. And those are so much fun. Because then all the neighbors come, you see. And that is the iron triangle of land use. Anywhere I would think on the planet, certainly here, that you've got the owner, all right? And then the owner is proposing something. The neighbors are usually opposing it. And then the government, the third part of the Iron Triangle, has to dispose of the matter one way or the other. And so that's what's going on all the time in zoning. I, I will add to this, um, although this is a, 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 a politically active uh, area and, and these this local legislation uh, and zonings and rezonings are are political that is by design the idea is that uh, governments are supposed to be responsible to their property owners right. and their citizens and and you know Gus made reference to the term not in my backyard or NIMBY which you will hear I, I actually um, try never to use that term, and this is one of my little soapbox items. Everybody has an interest that is important to them in some way. It's, it's, it's the home that they grew up in. It's the vision that they have for a new housing development that's going to be different from any other. It's the idea of owning their own business. It's whatever that set of interests is going to be. And at the point at which we refer to one set of interests as NIMBY, we're, we're in effect saying that's an unworthy because self-interested set of interests in opposition to something else which is clearly public spirited or for the larger good but which is also just a set of interests and so I would encourage you you know Pache Gus to try not to refer to uh, particular uh, people testifying or interests as NIMBY interests but to identify what the interest is is it is it preserving a quiet residential area? Is it dealing with better transportation? And then the system of laws that we have is a way of setting up rules that we're going to resolve these conflicts in. So in effect, we've, resolved, we've come up with this orderly way. It's better than every neighbor suing every neighbor, which is the old nuisance law system. It's better than the every neighbor challenging every neighbor to a duel, which is the sort of pre-common law system. Didn't um, work out for Hamilton, did it? It didn't. And wow. we, have this, we have this kind of messy local government kind of things, and people are in, invariably disappointed because they're winners and losers, and they feel passionately about these things. But, but the, the, the majesty of local land use law is really its, its capacity to address and, and deal with these kinds of issues. Well, I, I would just say, though, that, you know, you know, I've been doing this since 74, and look, if you have a comprehensive plan, comprehensive plans go through rigorous, painful hearings, and in the end, the comprehensive plan is always a series of compromises made by the local government over all the competing interests that are out there. The problem comes not in the adopting so much of the comprehensive plan. I mean, I've drafted comp plans, I've chaired those hearings, I've worked with community groups and neighbors and property owners and, and elected people, most of whom are insecure human beings, which is why they're there, to work out a comp plan that, that can be a series of compromises for how the community will grow and where things will be. It's the implementing that's the problem. Now, zoning is a big part of the implementing. When I use the word NIMBY, I'm talking about people who sign on to the comp plan until the day comes that what's in the comp plan is going to be implemented. And then they're first, at the, first in line at the hearing to say, oh, no, not here, someplace else. Classic example um, is affordable housing. Every local government in America says we need more affordable housing. Their comp plans all have a chapter on the need for affordable housing. I can promise you right now, depending upon where you live, there are parts of your community that have no affordable housing, will never have affordable housing. This didn't happen through the law of nature. This happened because they made sure that no affordable housing was ever going to be in their part of town or their part of the county or whatever. And um, I have worked on comp plans where we say we're going to spread things around. You know, everyone's going to take their fair share of like affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> But then you chair the hearings for the implementing on the zoning side, and you see what happens. Hence my, my NIMBY thing. Um, look, NIMBY's not so bad. It's better than banana. Banana is build absolutely nothing anywhere, anytime on planet. You know, and then nope, nope is the worst. See, NIMBY's really 
mild. Nope, nope hearings, and I've chaired a few nope hearings, which basically are not on planet Earth. <laughs> it's like just shoot it into outer space because nobody wants it. Like we're going to put all that nuclear stuff. You know, we're not even going to put it in, in the middle of Nevada where nobody is, you know. But it goes to what Jim is talking about, that it is all about competing interests. And the local legislators, in the end, working with the mayor or county executive, whoever the executive is, they work together, working with all those interests to cobble together something. And that's what zoning and planning comes to be. And then the next thing, maybe, because it's 1 o'clock almost, we should talk, touch on subdivision, don't you think? Uh, we should. I, I wanted to say a couple more words okay. about planning um, oh, okay. at, as, as well. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about eminent domain. And, eminent and domain, takings, subdivision, uh, eminent right. domain. And, and yeah. the one thing I want to interject before we jump into finish up with Jim's line of thought, and then we is everything we're talking about, remember, um, well, you don't have the outline in front of you, but as Jim said at the beginning, everything we do is under the constitutional system of the United States. And I want to say that we have the federal constitution, and in the federal constitution, everything we're talking about emanates from these, these um, rights that citizens have that are in the Fifth Amendment of the constitution. You've got to understand, that's what, all these battles when people say, I got a property right, or I got a right to do this, and I got a right to do that, you know, people throw these phrases around. Well, it's because in the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, there are the Due Process Clause and the um, uh, what's called the Takings or the Just Compensation Clause. But in the Fifth Amendment, um, that's where it says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It's 14th well, Amendment. But well, well, through the 14th <laughs> Amendment. But the Fifth Amendment's got the deprivation, the Due Process Clause is in the Fifth, and then it carries through in the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment added the Equal Protection Clause. And then the third clause that's in the Fifth Amendment, in addition to the 14th adding Equal Protection Clause, Equal Protection of the Laws, is you've got the deprivation, due process in the Fifth Amendment, and then you've got the thing, nor shall um, uh, uh, any person, right, nor shall any property be taken for public use without just compensation. That's called either the Takings Clause or the Just Compensation Clause. Those clauses, the Due Process and the Takings Clauses in the Fifth Amendment, undergird everything. Now, also understand, please, that all 50 states have their state constitutions, and they mirror the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments um, in their constitutions. They have Due Process Clauses. They have Takings Clauses. They have Equal Protection Clauses. Everything we're talking about, as Jim pointed out, with land use regulation emanates from the sovereignty of the state government. So basically what we're really talking about is it's all girded by the state constitution and all the rights laid out to property owners and citizens, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's with the federal constitution sitting there. Um, and I mention all of this because when it leads to legal conflicts, sometimes it's through, you know, the federal constitution. Sometimes it's brought under the st your state constitution. Sometimes it's both. And there are strategy reasons why you would only use your state constitution and never refer to the federal constitution. I'll cut to the chase on that for, for people, just so you get this in your head, as, um, and that is that your state constitution, people don't realize this, but the state constitution can, because states are sovereign, state constitution can afford more or greater individual rights and freedoms than come in the federal constitution. So whatever the federal constitution gives you as a citizen of the United States in terms of rights as a citizen, a state constitution can give you more. And so sometimes in these land use fights, all right, like affordable housing, to take an example, the case will be brought, reference will be made to the state constitution, no reference is made to the federal constitution at all. Why? Because you don't want it to be taken up by the United States Supreme Court, maybe. Maybe you'd want to make it go as far as your state Supreme Court, but no one can appeal to the United States Supreme Court, because the U.S. Supreme Court can only take cases, of course, that deal with federal law, meaning the federal constitution or federal statutes, right, or fights between states, obviously. So I, I mention that to you as a practice point, because everything we're talking about is girded by those constitutional rights in the federal and state constitutions, zoning, planning, everything. And we'll take questions for clarification, and then we'll stop talking at about quarter to two and take all general questions, but happy to take a, if we use an acronym that we shouldn't do, please 
raise your hand. Yeah, no, um, I work a lot on federal land, and so I'm just curious when you're talking about state and federal constitutions, you have federal land. Right? If you're dealing with federal land, which, by the way, 29% of the, of the land in the United States is owned by the federal government, 29%. And most of that's out west, of course. Yeah. Um, then you never, if you're working with federal lands, you're in, you are so lucky, lady, because you don't have to worry about state constitutions, state laws, local public hearings. If you're dealing with federal lands, you're dealing solely with federal law, the federal constitution, and the federal courts, period. Oh, during the 1972. 1872, when, you know, Mr. Grant became president. We can't hear. Federal what? Land Policy Management Act, 1976. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The issue, though, of of how federal land is treated, it, it, in general, and there are exceptions to all this. It right. is the, that the U.S. government, as the owner and manager of that federal land under the property clause of the Constitution, doesn't have to conform itself to state and local land use planning and zoning, although it has chosen to do so in certain circumstances. And we can, I'll, I'll allude to one, and if we have time, we'll come back to it. One of the only attempts by the federal government in this era, era of the 1970s when our major environmental laws were adopted was the Coastal Zone Management Act. Um, and through some uh, political machinations, um, Senator Henry Jackson of, of Washington State uh, got that through his, um, his committee, um, and basically it provided that under certain circumstances, federal activities in the coastal zones would conform to state coastal zone management. Plans. So there's sort of a give and take where under that law, if the states did certain things, they adopt coastal management plans uh, that met certain standards, the federal government would in its activities agree to be, the operative term is consistent with the State Coastal Zone Management mm -hmm. Act. And that, that is probably the, you know, the most integrated sor sort of set of activities. So where you have some of these military bases, for example, in, in Maryland or, or Virginia on the coastal zone, they have to go through a coastal <coughs> consistency review process with the state of Maryland and the state of Virginia with respect to their activities because of this federal legislation that, in effect, made those, those activities subject to state and, and, to some extent, local, but in that case, state um, land use environmental regulatory planning in a way that is not true generally of other mm -hmm. other federal activities. I, I did want to allude to come back to a couple of other uh, points on planning. We started talking zoning. One of the interesting things was, you know, zoning caught on so fast planning was almost an afterthought. So in the in the in the Zoning Enabling Act, um, it says it, it needs to be in accordance with a comprehensive plan, but the zoning, Standard Zoning Enabling Act of 1926 never told anyone what a comprehensive plan was. And then when they wrote the model planning statute in, in two years later, they used the term master plan instead of comprehensive plan. Um, it means the same thing. But we're, what we're left with is this idea that uh, you, you have constitutional authority overriding all these things, state and federal. Then you've got state enabling acts, and the state enabling acts basically say the local governments are supposed to plan, and then the zoning and other regulation is, is uh, in accordance with the plan. And then we'll talk a little bit about subdivision and other types of ordinances. But this is a nested hierarchy where at each level you need to be consistent. Your subdivision ordinance needs to be consistent with the zoning ordinance, which needs to be in accordance with the comprehensive plan, all of which has to be adopted under the rules that the State Enabling Act set up, all of which has to be within the power which the state constitution gives to the state legislature to, to to parcel this out to local governments. Now there's one other nuance of this state power that I, I want to throw into the mix, and that is how much power does the state give to the local governments? 
And there are basically two flavors under U.S. law. What, one flavor is we're not going to give them any power at all except what we explicitly give them. So we're going to say we're not going to imply that local governments have any power. We're going to say they don't have any power, but if we give them the power to zone um, cities of a certain size, that's all they've got. Uh, and if they want to zone anything larger or change payday on from Thursday to Monday, you can't do it unless the state legislature tells you. And those are called colloquially Dillon's Rule States, D-I-L-L-O-N, after a Judge Dillon who wrote a treatise on this in the 1880s. So Dillon's Rule States are ones where if the local government wants to do something, it has to point to a specific clause in the Enabling Act that allows it to do it uh, or, or that necessarily implies its ability to do that. Virginia is one of the stricter of the Dillon's Rule states. Dill and, and Jim lives in Virginia. Jim lives in a Dillon Rule state. Right. The other flavor, and it's sort of the opposite end, is the home rule state. And many states, either legislatively or by constitution, have said to local governments, you local governments, we trust you. You're democratically elected. We're going to let you do pretty much everything um, that a local government would normally do. And here's a bunch of powers. And some of them say write a home rule charter that defines your powers so your citizens can, can vote on the charter. But you don't have to keep coming back to us all the time. In reality, uh, well, gosh, you might. And I live in one of those. I live in Maryland in Silver Spring. I live near downtown Silver Spring, where you know, you can, you know, the go local government can pretty much do what it wants. Whereas in Virginia, they got to keep running to the state legislature just to get a traffic signal installed at an intersection. I kid you not. Yeah. All right. So the states of this union are either Dillon rule states, really, really strict, where the local, where the state legislature really likes to control what they parcel out to the local governments, and the home rule states, the where it's yeah. more loosey goosey. The reality That's of That's a technical term in planning. <laughs> loosey goosey. I'll have to spell that one. Um, it's in the Oxford English Dictionary. The the reality, though, is that most states are neither pure Dillon rule or pure home rule right. states. And in fact, people have made studies of Dillon's rule states where they've attempted to count them up. And you know, by some counts, if you look at, at state Supreme Court decisions that have cited Dillon or claim to be Dillon rule states, it's about three quarters of them. If you look at sort of who actually rigorously applies Dillon's rule, it's Virginia and maybe one or two others. But the point really, and the home rule also, in, in some states, certain kinds of, of uh, counties or, or cities get home rule, others don't. Um, and so it's sort of this, it, it's this mix and match, or it's these pizzas with different types of topping where, you know, you could be mostly meat with a little bit of, you know, vegetables, or you could be mostly vegetables with an occasional pepperoni. Um, there are very few or pure, very few pure uh, Dillon rule or home rule states, but you need to be aware of where you're practicing or where you're seeking uh, to have your local government do something because, you know, if you're in Virginia, most of the time it's prohibited unless the state legislature has told you you can do it. Mm -hmm. In Maryland, most of the time it's going to be okay unless there's something in the state code that says, uh, no, we, we keep this power at the state level. Right, right. And the big control mechanism in what Jim is describing, again, goes back to what's in the Constitution in terms of individual rights. I mean, that, that's the control mechanism, um, no matter what kind of state you're in. And... Uh, uh, by the way, a, an important point to understand, most land use cases um, that are brought in the United States, a zoning case, a subdivision case, whatever, most of those cases are brought in the state courts. And it, you know, it's, it, the cases are brought in the federal courts. Um, they tend to be cases that, in which federal constitutional rights are being asserted by somebody and they go to federal court. And a lot of federal courts will say, we don't have time to get into these nuances. So all I can deal with is big general principles and bottom lines to give you a sense of everything, which is what my outline tries to do. Most of the federal courts tend to say, geez, you should really be in your state court. You know, let your state courts deal with these land use fights and, you know, whatever. But 
but sometimes federal courts do hear these cases depending upon certain nuances, which we just don't have time to go into, um, but they always involved someone asserting a property right of some kind in which they're pointing to the United States Constitution in addition to the state constitution, and the federal court says, we're going to hear this case. But a lot of the federal courts will say, you know, you really should be in the state court. And so they abstain or they send it back and you've got to start over again, et cetera, et cetera. The point is with legal disputes that we're talking about, they tend to get resolved in the land use world in the state courts, unlike environmental laws, if you're dealing with federal environmental laws, then you're in the federal courts. If you're dealing with the state environmental laws, again, you're in the state courts. If you're dealing with both, then you're dealing with complicated issues, which is why we all are lawyers, to figure out where is the right court to be in to resolve this dispute. Should it be in the state court? Should it be in the federal court? Um, and this is why, of course, we have the federal system that we've got. You know, and overseeing it all is the United States Supreme Court. Um, so I just wanted to mention that um, practice point in terms of just the reality, because we've talked about legislative action. This is the judicial side of things, of course. And, and we're going to actually deal with uh, now a set of those issues, which are the property rights uh, disputes. And Gus has already set up the Fifth Amendment and Fourteenth uh, Amendment issue that the two kinds of, of federal claims that typically arise in land use cases that will get you into federal court are property rights and due process claims. Someone has taken my property without just compensation. You know, the city has devalued my property or or whatever. And First Amendment claims of one kind or another. I'm putting up a political sign and it violates the sign ordinances. But you know, I'm saying vote for Gus and. This, said he doesn't like my 25 feet by five foot sign that takes up my entire front yard. Right. Um, and, and those things come into to conflict and we see federal court cases uh, on First Amendment. And religious land uses is, is another area, again, a First Amendment issue where local governments get involved in regulating, you know, how much parking do you need for your new mega church? And is that just a land use decision or is that uh, really a First Amendment issue uh, that in some way is inhibiting the free exercise of religion in violation of the First Amendment? And as to that last point that um, before I, I lose this thought um, is that what Jim's pointing to on religious institutions, um, up until like around the 1980s, um, no one ever thought about this, about where churches and temples and synagogues and all places of worship could be because everyone knows in, in America they were all over the place and you had a First Amendment right to put a house of worship anywhere you wanted. Zoning ordinance could not say you can or cannot put a church or a temple or whatever here. You could put a house of worship anywhere protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. It's been that way from the beginning. But then what happened, because Jim used the magic word, and he used a word that was coined in the 1980s, megachurches. And suddenly we started having this thing where, as you know, churches began b being formed in the United States where they didn't have like a few hundred parishioners coming on a Sunday or a Saturday. They had thousands and thousands. And what does that mean? It means parking lots, traffic, cars, megachurches. And so local governments began to regulate because neighbors are screaming, we don't care if it's a church or a slaughterhouse. <laughs> they got 10,000 cars coming into our part of the city. You gotta regulate this. And politicians being elected by the people are saying, well, we gotta regulate it. And so they started regulating. And of course, as always happens, elected officials will sometimes go too far. And that's why we have laws um, and, and why we have rights in our constitutions. They go too far. And so they began to say, you just can't build them over there. And this led to legal disputes. So in the year 2000, and this is in my outline, the last thing in my outline, is what Jim was alluding to. Congress stepped in, very unusual. The Congress of the United States stepped into a land use fight at the local level across America, dealing with the conflict of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution and the sanctity of houses of worship. Um, and I will tell you right now, there is nothing like chairing a hearing, because I've done this, where you've got a bunch of priests, nuns, or rabbis staring at you it's like, oh my God, you know? Um, <laughs> and it's Literally. like, I had one where I had three Hasidic rabbis and I was thinking, thank God I'm Jewish because of what we're about to rule. And then we had another one where we had a bunch of, um, anyway, you all, anyway, these were, when, when they're sitting there, it's really complicated. Um, 
So Congress passed this law in 2000, which is referred to my, and it's getting at this point that Jim's referring to where they said, well, you really, really got to do a lot of things, which I don't have time to get into, before you can start regulating houses of worship. But it's getting at, and this is the bottom line, local governments can regulate things like parking and traffic and all the nuisance activities that Jim started talking about. Anything that deals with nuisance, you know, it's invading our neighborhood with sight, sound, fumes, littering, nuisance ideas, they can regulate, but they gotta be real careful about it and they gotta do it to the minimal extent possible so as not to trample on someone's First Amendment rights to practice their religion or to put up a political sign. So you can regulate. You can regulate time, place, and manner. You can regulate size of signs. But God knows in this country you can't regulate content. If someone wants to hold a sign in their front yard and say, God bless Karl Marx, you can do it. If you want to say, I hate Fidel Castro, fine. But if the regulation says the sign can only be five feet by four feet and no bigger, well, that's okay. You're not regulating the content. And that's what these First Amendment issues are often about. Because what they're often about is, are they really regulating content here, or are they re not regulating content? And, and, and the Supreme Court has been a real pain in resolving these disputes. I will tell you right now. The U.S. Supreme Court, Judge Posner, did you see what Posner did last week? Judge Posner of the Seventh Circuit. I know I digress, but this is good for you people. <laughs> <laughs> judge Posner, who's a famous, great American Federal Appeals Court judge, sits on the Seventh Circuit in Chicago, wrote a piece lambasting the United States Supreme Court for writing opinions that are way too long, filled with useless verbiage, and creating more confusion, and their role should be to clarify the law, not confuse everybody. And all of us practicing lawyers know this. They kn we all know it. And Posner, you know, obviously has figured out, I ain't going to be named to the U.S. Supreme Court, number one. <laughs> and he said what, and he actually used the word, it's BS. He spelled the word out in Zarco that a lot of what they write is BS. They're, they're pompous. He says they're pompous. <laughs> and they want to write an opinion that's 30 pages long when it ought to be 10 pages long. And let me just tell you right now, as practicing <laughs> lawyers, and, and Jim and I have to deal with this every day, if you can get a 10-page court opinion, it clarifies the thinking, the analysis, and the reasoning far better than if it's a 30- or 40-page opinion, That's all right? True. And what the U.S. Supreme Court has been doing, beginning in the 1970s, is writing longer and longer opinions. Up until the 1950s, I mean, Brown versus Board of Education was a short opinion, all right? Now they write 30, 40-page opinions on crazy things. Then they'll write concurring opinions, dissenting opinions. Then they're longer than the majority opinion. So I know I'm digressing and I can't remember why, but it gets back to, <laughs> it gets back to the mishmash of the First Amendment law that the U.S. Supreme Court has created, dealing with signs, dealing with um, pornography, whatever. And what Jim's talking about now, you know, it's in the context of all of that. So we're going to come back to the one set of constitutional issues on property rights and, and uh, diminutions in value and those sort of things. I will say, Gus and I didn't preview this digression, but I actually completely agree with him on the length of, of opinions. The opinions that have the most guidance are the ones that are much more tightly, um, tightly written and where the judges and their clerks don't have to show off all the research that they, they, have, they've done. they have done. But that's, that's a good topic for legal writing and uh, judicial decision making and the like. And so I want to use our last segment before we turn to what I hope is an ample question mm -hmm. time, talking about property rights. Mm -hmm. uh, Gus has alluded to the just compensation and due process clauses. The Fifth Amendment says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. One of the characteristics of, of government under the American system is that governments have been able to take property for public use. And the, the original classic example is where the governments have needed property for forts. You know, you want to be able to put the fort out in the logical place for the fort. And at some point, you needed access roads or military roads to connect the forts. And so that's kind of the classic. It's a governmental function. It's appropriate. And of course, back in the pre-constitutional days, there was no obligation to pay anyone. It was just your bad luck. You were benefiting from the fact that your government had put up a fort 
Um, that's it. Well, the U.S. Constitution says um, you can still take, federal government can still take, but it has to provide just compensation to the owner. Now, the states have their, their own just compensation clauses. They come in various flavors, but the states over the course of time, and they didn't all pay from day one, but all the states have some provision which says when the, the state or an authorized entity condemns land for a road or a pipeline or a railroad or a school site or whatever, they have to pay. They have to provide just compensation. We call that eminent domain. In effect, it's eminent or it's preeminent because it is stronger. It comes down on top of, it's a domain that comes down on top of private property. Um, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, uh, basically the courts have held, applies the just compensation clause to the states. So if any state or local government is taking property because they want to build a school there or whatever, it's uh, subject not only to the state provision that says you got to pay and go through proper procedures, it's also subject to federal claims, which is why many of the cases that are important end up in, in federal courts. So it's, it's pretty clear if it's, a, if it's a function like forts. You know, schools, that was kind of an innovation in the 19th century, but okay, roads, okay. What about um, economic development? What if the state take, takes the viewpoint or the city takes the viewpoint that we are a depressed area and what we really need is to you know, clear out some of these slums and you know, redivide or aggregate these parcels of property together and we'll put up a nice uh, you know, set of houses and some office buildings and stores and it'll revitalize things. Is that a proper use of of the eminent domain power. And the Supreme Court in the 1950s, um, in a case right here in Washington, D.C., said, um, yes, that's an appropriate use of the eminent domain power. It doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment. To clear out what was a relatively thriving neighborhood of Southwest Washington, mostly African-American neighborhood, to put up a bunch of freeways and some of those terrible office buildings that we've all come to, to know and not uh, appreciate, but the Supreme Court says that's, that's all right. It doesn't violate the Constitution to do it. Turns out in retrospect it may be unwise. It may have advantaged the powerful over the powerless, but it's not unconstitutional to do it. What about straight economic development? And that's so, under the federal Constitution. Federal Constitution. Your state courts may say it violates their state Constitution. You see? Right. You begin to see now how, as this plays out, depending upon where you are, you may bring a case in your state under the state constitution and, and the Supreme Court of the United States has said, that's fine. The states can say it's not kosher. We're just saying under the federal constitution, it's kosher up to a point. I mean, the Supreme Court has laid out, you know, they've said, if you've got a comprehensive plan, if you're implementing the comprehensive plan, there's all these things the US Supreme Court said but then they also said, of course, if state Supreme Court could say otherwise. I mean. Yeah, and we'll, we'll set this up if we, we can with, uh, with the Kelo case, which, which is, provides which is, an opportunity. Which is how all this exploded a few years ago. So a few years ago, a number of years ago, the city of Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is a declining city, decided that um, they would uh, remove some of these and aggregate some of these blighted properties. And... Basically, uh, they went through a long planning process and came up with a, a, a scheme that would have new residential housing and new economic development and provide a nice campus for a, uh, a, a global multinational company Pfizer. to come in. It wasn't going to name was, names. Oh, you can but, name it. It's Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. But the point, the, the point, <laughs> the point was that they had gone through this process, but there were holdouts that weren't willing to sell their property that they had lived in and cherished and loved uh, for all these years just to accommodate the city. So the city, under Connecticut law, exercises its eminent domain power to say, we know you don't want to sell your ancestral home that you've lived in for 85 years, um, but we're taking it and our only fight is over how much we're going to pay you. Um, and, a jury, okay, under and, and a jury, I understand right. in American law, right. a jury 
you know, so your peers are deciding what's just compensation. And it's a good system. I, I can tell you, juries come in, you know, you know, the battle is usually over the taking. Um, juries do, you know, because it's a jury system, you know, the, the money is not decided by some bureaucrat in Washington or the, or the state capitol. The money that's fair compensation is decided by, you know, the person's neighbors and peers. That's what the jury system is. So this was a fight over should they be allowed to take these homes to begin with. Yeah, and the issue then, this was legal under Connecticut law. The question then is, is it, is it legal under the Fifth Amendment, or does it violate the Fifth Amendment? Nor shall pro property be taken for public use without just compensation. Is this a public use? That's the issue. Is this a issue. public use was the issue that the homeowners then took. It went to the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court, in a hotly contested decision, five to four, ruled that that taking did not violate the U.S. Constitution. So it's important to recognize what they, what they decided, because people say, well, this is terrible. People shouldn't be taking homes in order to advantage multinational companies. The Supreme Court is not passing judgment on the wisdom of that. It's passing judgment on whether the public use provision of the Fifth Amendment constrained what Connecticut was willing to see as a public use under its state law. And it said it's not a violation of federal law for a state to, to uh, define it public use in, in this way. There was a, a immediate reaction and backlash. A lot of states then immediately went out and passed amendments to state constitutions or to their state eminent domain laws that said, no way, no how is any city of my state ever going to take private property for a commercial use or reuse. Uh, for, you know, Virginia, where I live, uh, passed, uh, they had two of these on the books already, and they, they passed a constitutional amendment, uh, which was, uh, had to go through several legislative sessions, but last year was uh, ad adopted, which makes it clear that under Virginia law, you can't use eminent domain for anything like that. It's and that's okay, because the states have chosen to constrain those eminent domain powers and their powers there. So under federal law, there is latitude of states to define what can be taken for eminent domain. Mm -hmm. But the states are free to say, you know, we're going to prohibit ourselves, or constitutionally, the voters are going to say, our state law will never be interpreted to allow. And again, it goes back to the point I made earlier, that the states being sovereign entities um, in partnership with the federal government can always enhance private individual rights. They can't, if the U.S. Supreme Court hands down a ruling dealing with individual rights of any kind, any kind, the states can't make it worse, but they can make it better for individual rights. And this is a classic individual rights type of issue. This is a question of what's public use if you're taking it from private owner A in order to hand over to private owner B. In this case, from take Suzette Kilo's house, um, which was, you know, and then hand it over to Pfizer Pharmaceutical for their thing. Now the irony is, and I will tell you from a practice point of view, that the city of Bridgeport, the reason this case went to the United States Supreme Court, understand the United States Supreme Court takes 1% of the cases knocking on their door. In the ancient um, Precambrian period when I was up there, they would take 3% of the cases. Today they only take 1% of the cases. So they're taking fewer cases and writing longer opinions. <laughs> you do the math. <laughs> and so there's only a 1% chance of your case, you know, when someone says, I'm going to take this all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. I, my response always is, if, if I'm not biting my tongue, is fat chance. Um, though I can give you the odds depending upon a lot of factors and variables. Yeah, and if they give Gus a retainer, I'm sure he'll look favorably on the I had options. some success in the 1980s in those takings cases. <laughs> we, we knew what we were doing, but we knew what we were doing. I the, say, my, my, point, my point is about this, this case, which is interesting because it sums up everything that we're talking about, land use, takings, blah, 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 is that the, the Brid, this is something for you to know as practitioners. This case never should have been in the courts. The city, when you looked at the record of what the city did to these property owners, the city did everything wrong. Most 
taking situations are worked out by local governments with the property owners. 90% of the time, they sit down and say, we need these properties that you all own for this public function, and they work it out. And they figure out, okay, we're going to we're going to move you from this house to that house. We'll even pick up your house and pick up your house and move it over there. And we're going to pay you so much money that you'll be able to buy two houses for the house we are taking. In this case, um, when you looked at the record and read all the briefs, you realize, and Justice Stevens in the majority opinion alluded to it, this was a case that the city did everything wrong. And that's why the case went all the way through the Connecticut courts and the U.S. Supreme Court and blah, blah, blah. Had they just done everything the right way, the smart way, as most local governments do, this never would have been taken by the court. The reaction was what Jim said, all hell broke loose, because the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, under federal law, what can we say? We're looking at our older cases, and it says, yeah, we think you can do it. The dissent by O'Connor said, are you out of your friggin' mind? You're taking property owner A's property to give property owner B. Here's the punchline. Um, the punchline is that the plan was never implemented. They were taking properties, and they never even had a plan that was financially viable. And in the end, Pfizer never even came. And so they took these homes. They knocked down a bunch of them. They moved these people. Everyone got paid tons of money. Don't get me wrong. Everyone got their just compensation. But they didn't want to leave their neighborhood. Um, and the briefs that were filed, I mean, NAACP, files an amicus brief saying this is just wrong. You're taking it from poorer people to give it to wealthy people. That's what You're going to put up fancy condos for wealthy people. So it led to this social battle. And that's what Jim's alluding to, because what really was going on here was not just a legal or constitutional dispute. It was social. It was class-driven. And when you heard the debates, when you saw what was going on in the state legislatures, there was a lot of this social stuff going back and forth poorer communities um, be, had losing their properties for some rich thing and the kicker in the Bridgeport story was they never built the damn thing if you go up there today it, it was incredible so they weren't implementing a plan they had an idea for a plan they adopted the plan they just never implemented the plan and they jumped too far they began taking these properties the smart local governments Gus I don't know if we should re-argue Kilo well, no, because but I, 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 I want them to understand that the smart local governments if you represent local governments make sure that you've got a financially viable plan that's begun to be implemented before you actually take someone's private property to implement the plan. In Bridgeport, they just grab the properties, and then what they've got up there now is a moonscape, and Pfizer said, never mind, we're not coming. I would argue, Gus, uh, just in, in the interest that there are other views of whether Bridgeport did everything wrong. They did have a plan. They had spent many years putting the plan together. It may have been economically unviable, but the litigation may have had something to do with that, as well as changes in the economic environment worldwide. I would for only the say, Jim, that the New York, industry. even the New York Times, in their famous editorial on the aftermath of all of this, said what Bridgeport did here was dumb. Even the New York Times editorialized that they did it the wrong way, which is why we ended up in the U.S. Supreme Court, which is why the NAACP and these other groups jumped in and said this is just wrong. And in California, for those of you from California, you may know this already, California, they, under Jerry Brown, the governor, and he's no radical conservative, God knows, they've, they have eliminated these redevelopment agencies. They're gone in the state of California. That was how they dealt with all of this. They just got rid of the agencies. So the point is, it's, it's up to the local and state governments to regulate eminent domain. There are many states that still allow this sort of use. Uh, Minnesota is one of them. New York uh, State is, is still one of them. And, the, and, and, and all I want to make smartly. clear is that this is a choice. Uh, I mean, there's a legal debate, and the legal debate for now is resolved by the Supreme Court, which says that the, 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 the federal constitution governments. is not a bulwark against an eminent domain action of this, your, your state legislation or your state constitution may be. Right. I wanted to touch on one other issue we if I can. We need to talk about and inverse. Th you just got to that, touch on inverse. Yeah, that was the other, we got to tell them the about other that. issue, but we have uh, just a, a minute or two. And, uh, Let's do inverse. Yeah, so we were, we're talking about eminent domain where the government is actually setting out to take the property. They're taking title. They're paying for it, and something's being done with it, some public use, uh, however defined. The point is, is that in the court case, the plaintiff is the government, and the defendant is the property owner. Now we're going to flip it. 
So there are cases where a set of land use regulations or environmental regulations has an effect on the property owner that feels like to the property owner economically or as a matter of expectations, this has the same effect as if they have come in and seized my property. So I have bought a parcel of property on the beach in South Carolina and I'm going to put up my dream vacation home and yet there's a rule that says now I can't build on the beach because the state legislation says all these people are building on the beach is going to lead to erosion hazard, you know, health, safety, welfare, morals, I guess. But at any rate, Only the, you're going to put a porn shop in the house. So, so there are cases in which a, a regulatory action, which doesn't take title to property, nevertheless takes some of the value of the property from the point of view of the landowner or the land user. And the question is, at what point does this non-taking amount to a, a taking, taking under, under federal um, and state? Because mm -hmm. the states all have these two. And the, the sort of touchstone case goes back to, to the mining industry. And in the 1920s, Pennsylvania enacted a, a law which limited where underground mines could go because uh, they had roads that kept falling into the mine pits. And, and houses Houses, fell in. That houses kept would fall in. Falling in. So they passed a, a law which basically limited um, where those underground mine voids could go and provide that you needed to leave pillars under people's pillars of coal under people's houses and the like. That case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, famous case called Pennsylvania Coal. Um, and it, it's one where uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. coined the aphorism that um, when a, a uh, regulation, regulation goes too far, it becomes a taking. Yeah. So if the regulation goes too far, it's treated as though it were an eminent domain taking, and it's a violation of due process in that case, or as we would talk about it now, would require just compensation if, if you were to actually do that. Justice Brandeis, in a famous dissent in that same uh, opinion, noted um, that uh, there was a pretty good record that there was a lot of value left in those uh, coal mines and that Pennsylvania was not actually going too far and that there were, had been other Supreme Court cases that suggested that the government was simply exercising its police power. So that's been sort of our touchstone. Does the regulation go too far? And over the course of uh, 70, 80 years of, of litigate, 85 years of litigation since that time, the Supreme Court and other courts have been trying to figure out, are there any bright line rules or rules of thumb when we can tell when uh, regulation has gone so far, too far, that it requires uh, just compensation or the government action has to, to back off. And, and the cases, and we're just going to name them briefly, the, the lead case in the modern era is the Penn Central case, which involved the plan to um, use the air rights over Penn Central Railway Station in New York City, and where the court basically established a balancing test. Um, and the balancing test had to do with the character of the governmental action and um, the uh, economic extent of economic um, mm -hmm. frustration of um, distinct investment distinct it, right. It, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm trying to remember that you know, without writing them down. Right. The, the balancing test. But the upshot of the Penn Central case is you kind of look at what the government's setting out to do, what the property owner reasonably expected to do with his or her property, what the diminution in value is, and sort of muddling that all together in a way that still remains somewhat unclear, you would decide whether the regulation goes too far. If Penn Central is the test that is applied to most land use regulation, in most instances, the court is going to find there is not a taking, and they will allow the, the land use regulation to, to go forward without requiring compensation. There, there are several regulatory takings tests. The U.S. Supreme Court has handed them down over the years, and including as recently as a few weeks ago, um, which is the Coons case. But the, the point is Penn Central came down in 76. Since Penn Central, the Supreme Court has taken a number of these regulatory takings cases and has begun to enunciate a series of rules. So um, I have an outline that I use in conferences all across the United States 
to explain to lawyers and judges what the rules are. We don't have time to go through all of it, but the bottom line is this. Looking at the cases, you can see what the rules are and how the court has, has refined and clarified these rules since the Pennsylvania Cole versus Mahon decision of 1922 and Penn Central versus New York City of 1976. In the 1980s and 90s and 2000s, the Supreme Court has taken a series of cases raising these precise questions of when does land use regulation, environmental regulation go too far and create a taking. The first thing to know is if there is value wipeout, that is a, that's a per se taking. Supreme Court has said if someone's property is wiped out completely, you know, completely or basically largely completely, almost completely, whatever that means, um, you have a regulatory taking for which just compensation comes. If you have something less than a value wipeout, the other kind of taking um, is what's called physical takings. There are regulatory takings and there are physical takings. Physical takings often come up in land use and environmental regulation. I've been involved in a lot of these cases, wetlands cases and all kinds of cases, zoning, whatever. Physical taking is where the government does something that physically invades or intrudes on your property. And that's a physical taking. The oldest and classic example is where the Army Corps of Engineers builds a dam creates a lake, the water goes beyond what it's supposed to go, floods a farmer's property. That, by definition, according to the United States Supreme Court from a 19th century decision, they created the concept of, you know what, it's not imminent domain, they didn't bring a lawsuit to take the farmer's property for which just comp that is, but they built the dam, the water went further than it was supposed to, invaded the farmer's property, that's a physical invasion, and the U.S. Supreme Court said, that is a taking, you must pay just compensation. Physical takings have gone on to be things like New York State passes a statute saying in apartment buildings in the, in the state of New York, if you attach cable TV's facilities to the apartment buildings, that's a physical invasion. And that's a famous case from the early 80s. Justice Marshall writes the opinion. And, and, and again, it's because um, the state has authorized a physical invasion, intrusion, touching of someone's private property. Now, the just compensation for attaching those boxes as big as a bread basket might be really small, but the point is it's a physical taking. Um, I'm involved in a case like this now um, in which it, it's, it's, again, there are physical and regulatory takings. Regulatory, which Jim is touching on now, is classic land use regulation. And the Supreme Court has said value wipeout, that's a regulatory taking. Penn there, Central. With, with certain exceptions. There's certain exceptions. We just don't have time to do with these. But, but and then, then if you don't have a per se taking, it's a physical taking or it's, it's, um, it's not physical, it's not value wipeout, then you apply the balancing test as, Tim's talking, as, as Jim's talking about from the Penn Central decision. And the Supreme Court has said, you look at what is the impact on the private property owner? What's happened to that property owner? Then you look at what is the public purpose being advanced? And then the third factor is, um, have distinct investment-backed expectations of the owner been destroyed? And that gets to all kinds of interesting legal issues, I can tell you. You can imagine just that phrase. It can, you know, well, what does that mean? What are distinct investment-backed expectations? And were they destroyed? Those are all takings tests. The final thing is, this is big, um, it's what happened a few weeks ago. There was a case in 1987, the Nolan case that I was involved in, in which the U.S. Supreme Court said, you know what? You can have a regulatory taking. And this happened in Nolan versus California Coastal Commission, 1987. By the way, in 87, this is where the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the first English case in which the Supreme Court said a land use regulation can be called a taking. And when that happens, the remedy for a taking is just compensation under the United States Constitution. Well, they didn't say that to 1987. All right. In Nolan, just a few weeks later, they then said, and you know what? In the Nolan case, there in California, the government approved the project that was proposed by Pat and Marilyn Nolan, which was to build a house on the beach. Um, and the Coastal Commission said, we don't want you to build a house on the beach. But you know what? You can build a house on the beach if you meet the following bunch of conditions. The bottom line is this. The U.S. Supreme Court has said, and they clarified this again in the Kuntz decision of a few weeks ago, which is in the materials that you have, okay? So it's right there. And the Supreme Court said that whether the government approves your project subject to conditions or disapproves your project because you refuse to do those conditions, if those conditions go too far, 
than their exactions. It's like extortion. That's the word that the court has used. It's like extortion. It's more than a reasonable condition. It goes too far, going back to the words that Jim referred to that Holmes used in 1922. And in those situations, the project could be approved or disapproved, but if those conditions for approval or disapproval go too far, that is a taking as well. And We're the final thing they said sorry. a few weeks ago, um, and, uh, um, and then, by the way, when you read the Kuntz decision, understand this. This is why um, reading court opinions are fascinating, and then we'll shut up. Okay. Well, then we'll shut up. Notice when you read the Kuntz decision, there are two issues. Whether or not a condition can be a taking if you don't approve the project. That was the first issue. All nine justices said, yes, that would be a taking. All nine. They split five to four on the second issue. Does the exaction have to be for, for a real property interest, like an easement, or can it be just money? You have to spend money to do something, and that's where the court split. Five said, if money is part of the condition, that can be an exaction, that can be a taking. The four-person dissent said, no, we think money should not be an exaction that is a taking. That's what happened in Kuntz a few weeks ago. We're going to leave it there. Gus and I love this, uh, love this, stuff. Love this stuff, and we should do another Open entire session on um, takings law and so forth. But and that's an overview of, of, of zoning, planning, yeah. subdivision, eminent domain, and we're yeah. happy to take questions. So you've essentially completed an entire semester's course in under two hours, but let's have some questions if we may. I was going to ask a different question, which you answered with that. <laughs> um, but I, I will, I, I guess, um, can you talk just for a minute about how you, in the process that you were talking about earlier with comprehensive plans and that kind of thing, how you balance when you're, or how officials can balance the um, interests of people when some people bring a lot more um, resources to bear on the issue, like the Ed Muskies of the world, or I live in D.C. where the comprehensive plan process is going forward and the people in my neighborhood are extremely, I will say, NIMBY. <laughs> and it's very frustrating um, for people who want to see some changes in the, the city, but it's, it, it's just, it's very frustrating. And it's I, frustrating I don't know how because, to I'll repeat the question. The question is um, from, from um, a person in the District of Columbia that, you know, it's hard for people who tend to have less power or influence to get their way in these land use hearings from people who may have more power or influence or money or whatever. Uh, let me answer it this way, because I've chaired those hearings. And by the way, Mr. Muskie lost. We voted against what he wanted. I always used to say to all my fellow people in the political, you know, I always said, we always have to remember who's not in the room, which is the average working stiff. The people who tend to be in the room are people who have the time to be in the room. The, and, and, and for example, if you schedule hearings during the daytime, that's very unfair to working people if, um, or to single parents. So, you know, to answer your question, the way to deal with these things is have hearings in the evenings. Um, um, have um, local governments that care about this sort of thing, and lots of them do, they, they do massive outreach to communities that often don't show up at hearings, people, uh, communities of lesser means, they're poorer communities. You know, I always used to say the average working stiff in Wheaton, that's who we are sitting there for, not just the wealthy patrons who live in McLean, Virginia, or Bethesda, Maryland. And so um, everyone understands that dynamic. And so, you know, that's the the trick is to make sure that people understand that dynamic, to understand that not everyone sitting out there is speaking for the greater good and the greater public, that if it's the same 30 people and they all have fancy handbags, you know, it, it, they're not necessarily work for everybody. And so I can tell you that it's a constant um, effort that local governments make every day to make sure they understand who the, and of course that's the beauty of the democratic system. Because at the end of the day, the people making the decisions are elected or unelected every two years or every four years. And, and as we all understand, that's what politics is all about. Because those local legislators, they pay attention to who votes. And the bottom line is, if people turn out to vote, 
that who has influence on the people making the decisions. And if they don't turn out to vote, then the people who do turn out to vote, I mean, it classic, you know, you get the government you deserve. I don't know if I answered your question no, right, no. but that's What's what I've learned in 39 years of doing this. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how sustainability, resource conservation, climate change are starting to really kind of come up against land use law and personal property rights and maybe share like your most favorite or most kind of telling situations on that topic. Okay, yeah, the, um, the question had to do with how does, how do issues of sustainability and climate change uh, uh, come up against land use uh, decision making and are there experiences that, that speak to that? There, there's been a lot of evolution. So we've been talking about kind of the, the, the land use system that we created in the 1920s and have lived with ever since. But there's been a lot of lawmaking uh, at particularly local government level that deal with issues of climate and sustainability mm -hmm. and wetlands and right. neighborhood vitality. Green uh, building. Mixed use development is sort of the watchword. So we're trying to get away from separation of uses. And green buildings. Green buildings, Gus mentions. Um, there, there are uh, cities and, and towns that require uh, LEED certified uh, buildings in all new construction, which is a certification system that deals with the materials and energy efficiency and environmental footprint. There's also a whole set of uh, environmental laws that uh, local governments have enacted dealing with, um, you know, depending on their politics or if they're assessing their carbon footprint and, um, and their water footprint, how much water are they using and what's happening to storm water. The Environmental Law Institute, a little pitch here, we have done a series of books, um, many of them written by a famous land use law professor named John Nolan, N-O-L-O-N, um, writing about this uh, outgrowth of local environmental uh, lawmaking in the U.S. I did one a number of years ago called Nature Friendly Ordinances, which was a, was a look at that uh, as well. And there's this whole movement of sustainable cities. There's a network of sustainability coordinators in cities across the U.S. and globally, but there's a, this sustainable cities um, network where um, people in city government are exchanging ideas about how to do their uh, fuel purchasing and capital planning um, so that they're more climate friendly uh, and energy efficient. So it's it's a wonderfully uh, vibrant and diverse area. Um, Gus, I know you teach some. I teach right. uh, evenings at the Virginia Tech uh, Urban Planning School in Alexandria, and this is what people are, are working in in the land use area. And and to to make an important legal point here, because you raise an important issue. Um, and they're mentioned, it, that these are mentioned at the end of my outline, which is the federal government. We have the federal statutes, these environmental statutes, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, and so forth. Those laws um, are all federal environmental laws. A lot of states have similar statutes, of course. It's important for us to understand under the federal system, as we all understand, that these federal environmental laws sometimes get involved with local land use stuff. And so there is this careful balancing that goes on, I can tell you from a practitioner's point of view, because, I mean, my law firm, all we, you know, we deal with all this every day. And how do you work with clients, be they government agencies or private sector, in terms of the federal environmental statutes, state laws, and the local land use laws, to get them all to work together? And the federal government has become, as you know, since the 1970s, more involved with local land use stuff because of the federal environmental statutes. But the federal government also knows that they don't do, quote, land use. They always say, that's local. We don't do that. But we all understand that, yeah, right, with a wink and a nod, because they get involved on, like, wetlands. And then you've got the federal agency, the state agency, and the local agency. At the end of the day, here's what matters. Most citizens of the United States, you know, people are, it's a, it's a democracy. Everyone votes. Okay, so you got voting going on. 
people know who their city council members are. They know who their mayor is, and they know who, the, who their county executive is, and those people are accountable to them for all kinds of stuff. And it doesn't matter to a citizen, is that a local law thing or a state law thing? Or if they don't know, they don't care. The mayor is responsible <laughs> if it's hurting my property or me or my family or whatever, and you're responsible. Now, we have congressmen. Right? We got state legislators and we got the congressmen, the senators. And the, now, look, I've testified to Congress on federal environmental statutes, explaining to them how they work and don't work. And I can tell you that the reality is that nobody, most people who vote, have no idea who their state legislators are. They vote for them, but they don't know who these people are. And they don't even know exactly what they do. They might know who their federal congressman is, they might be able to name one of their U.S. senators. But here's the punchline. I can tell you from talking with everybody, the agency people, the senator people, whatever, everybody knows that no U.S. senator of a state can tell those people at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or EPA or whatever the district office is in that state, this is what you've got to do and stop screwing around. They don't do that. A mayor can do it. A county executive <laughs> can do it. No, really, this is the way it is. So to answer your question, the, the people have control at the local level. They have less control at the state level, and they have even less control at the federal level. But because congressmen and congresswomen, congresspersons are elected every two years, they're always nervous Nellies. The people who have the least knowledge of what's going on and the least control are U.S. senators. They enact the laws, and they have no idea what they're doing. And then they have very little influence over the agencies. Congress people have more influence because they're representing fewer people, okay? So that's the reality to get to your point, and that's why what's going on, this hodgepodge of trying to work things out that Jim's referring to, it's because of the whole accountability issue. Let's see if we have time for uh, one more question. Yes. Um, if you could speak into the microphone. Hello, uh, I have a question for like the taking lands, residential lands for commercial use. I, I just wonder uh, what U.S. has experienced when it was going through the urbanization and industrialization at the time of which the competing interests between uh, of the, uh, the, the, the governance uh, eagerness to achieve economic growth and the, uh, the, the farmers' interest of preserve, preserving their lands, that will come to an issue of food security and uh, agriculture security, such kind of issues. The, the question is, what happened in the United States, if, if I understand this right, when farmers would have their property and then government would want to take their property for economic development? Um, in the United States, the economic development issue did not really happen in this country until the 1970s. In the 1950s, when this country began to do, quote, urban renewal, uh, which is the 1954 Supreme Court decision that Jim referred to, the Supreme Court and the government and the lower courts and government agencies all said you have to have slums in cities. You have to have blight. To, to justify taking the property. So it was all about slums, tenement housing in cities. It never was about taking farmers' land because that would never be blight. So it never occurred to anyone that you could take a farmer's property and hand it over to another private property interest like a, a hotel or somebody. You couldn't, it would never have occurred to anyone that you could do that. By the 1970s, it began to happen, which is then what led to th this issue that Jim and I talked about and even debated a few minutes ago, because this is the issue of can you do something beyond blight? You just want to change the private use from um, a lower kind of private use to a higher kind of private use. Can the government use its power of eminent domain to do that? And okay. clearly that was the issue in the Kelo case and the states, as Jim pointed out, have been, every state has dealt with this question in a variety of ways and um, that's what happened. But the time frame for that really started in the 1970s here. There, there is very little history in this country, a, a, as opposed to certain other countries, of the government seizing private land in order to do economic development projects, as opposed to uh, some things like military installations or, or roads. So it, it's, it's not been our his, historic experience. 
Let me say um, thank you to all of you for participating. Um, I'll hang around, and, and Gus, you may want well, to. Well, actually, I, I have to get to a um, everything we've been talking about. I am now going to two back-to-back -back meetings um, um, in the region uh, dealing with everything we're talking about where I'm trying to avoid two gigantic land-use train wrecks. So um, we better meeting, let Gus go. I will remain. Uh, Shandor, Jim can speak for else? me. Um, I'm adequately, eloquently, ably. I know he can, but I'm supposed to be someplace at three o'clock, um, and then someplace else at four thirty. Um, really, to talk about everything we're talking about and trying to explain to government people and private people, it doesn't have to be this way. You could do it that way, and then it won't end up on the front page of the Washington Post or in court. I mean, there are ways to resolve disputes. You know, lawyers, our job is to try to resolve disputes and avoid the fights. That's our job. Thank you. I want to say. Yeah.